Hi, I'm Fernando Bernal. It is my distinct pleasure to have in our studios Mr. Kurt St. Thomas. Mr. St. Thomas has a long history in the film and broadcasting industry, and his most recent accomplishment is the release of his latest film, a recreation of Rudolf Matei's film noir, D.O.A. As in the original movie, Mr. St. Thomas recreated the film in black and white, right here in St. Augustine, given the ancient city and 1949's look. For this film, Mr. St. Thomas surrounded himself with a stellar group of actors. Playing the main character of Frank Bigelow is John Doe, a well-known musician with the iconic Los Angeles punk band X. The supporting cast includes Grace Bryan, the lovely Paola Duque, Matt Pinfield, Chat Light, and others. Let's get started. Is everything's going? Yeah, yeah. Hey, man. First of all, thank you for making time to come here, man. That's awesome. Really you're appreciate welcome. it. So I know me. you're busy. I know you got stuff happening this week, and, and you made time to come in. And I'm exhausted right I'm now. I'm honored, and I thank you. I really think. And also, congratulations on, on Las Vegas uh, Award, the Film Award. Thank you. It's, uh, now, there were all the ones we were selected. Where's the music coming from? I'm going to turn it up because it's probably a couple of regular stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't want to... So are we actually gonna... rolling? Is this, we're rolling, brother. Where we're, is we're... Everything's going? Yeah, yeah. So what I'm going to do is, well, we'll talk about that later. You got to cut that out? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I, I, it wasn't, I don't even think it came through. So no, it wasn't that much of a deal anyway. So... <clears throat> um, <laughs> what the <was> podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I should have came to your crib first. <laughs> <laughs> What's happening? Um. So the so some of the other places that you submitted your 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 film to. First of all, the film. The film. I made a movie. You made a movie. Uh, ta da. DOA. Yep. Why DOA? Well, I mean, I, I went and looked on. Why online. did I remake it? Yeah, yeah. Why that one? Out of so many um, public domain things. Yeah, it's it was in the public domain, so that you know, for everybody that doesn't know what that means, it's basically means the people that originally made the movie gave up. Um, actually, I think this was through a clerical error. If I if I've understood the history correctly, but anyway, they lost the rights to the movie, so it's in the public domain, which means that anybody can um, basically use the story. And can, how much can you change in the story so that it doesn't suddenly become something else? Well, you can do really whatever you want to because it's in the public domain. Ah, right. So, like, you know, many other kind of classic stories have been told over and over and over in different versions. And I found it in the public domain and I um, I had seen it. I had actually seen uh, the original version and the version that came out in the 80s with Dennis Quaid. Um and I really like things that are symmetrical. Like, I just like DOA. I was like, that would look killer on a poster. <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, it has a good vibe to it. It's easy. And uh, I just felt like it was a cool premise. And I wanted to make a film noir movie. I, I really wanted to make a movie similar to like Chinatown. That was like kind of my goal. I was like, I want to make a film noir movie. And, um, and I just took the, you know, I took, I basically just took the premise of the movie, which is a guy gets poisoned 
and he tries to solve the his own mystery. Mm-hmm. And so in the original movie, the the main character is like an accountant, but in my version, I made him already a private eye because that's like even more kind of in the film noir uh, world. So that was basically it. I just, I thought it was cool. And also the star of the movie, John Doe, who is from the band X, there's actually a song, an X, an X song, where he says DOA in it. He's actually referring to, there was a punk band, uh, I think they might still be around, I'm not really sure, but uh, called DOA. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. and he's yeah. referring to them. Yeah. Um, and when I was, like, staring at it, I like the title, you know, I was, like, looking through public domain records, and I saw it, and I was like, DOA. And immediately I could hear John singing in my head. And I was like, wow, that's really weird. And then... Um, uh, this was kind of right before I moved to St. Augustine, and I, I lived in Los Angeles for about 13 years, and um, I was, like, trying to figure out how I could make this movie, and then suddenly I moved to St. Augustine because of Hurricane Matthew, and I moved here to be close to my mom, and I had only been here maybe I had just bought my house and it was like two weeks after I bought my house, it was announced that X was going to play at the amphitheater. And I was like, that is the craziest thing. And I called John and I said, hey, John, um, I moved to St. Augustine, Florida. And he's like, oh, that's cool. Like, we're playing there. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, I know. And so uh, he came here and uh, ended up uh, like the day before and... Um, we just hung out and then they played the amphitheater and then they actually, which is very weird. Um, I went down to Fort Lauderdale to see X as well on the same little tour. And it was at that moment I was like, Hey, do you ever see the original DOA? And he was like, no. And, uh, and then after like hanging out for a couple of days, he called me like two weeks later and he's like, yeah, I watched it. He's like, what do you want to do? And I was like, I want to make kind of my own version of like a Chinatown meets the premise of DOA. So that that was kind of the initial thing. And uh, and now five years later, I have a movie that's going to world premiere in uh, a couple awesome. of days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In Fort Lauderdale. In Fort Lauderdale. Oddly enough, the one place I go to see X and hang out with John in Fort Lauderdale. You know, I, I had, honestly, I had not heard of John Doe before, but when I started looking into John Doe, D-O-A, you have the Jane Doe, John Doe. Yeah, yeah. And it turns out it's an actual guy named John Doe. Yeah, well, yeah, that's <laughs> the thing. Most people that, uh, if if they know who he is, they're just like, what? John Doe is in the movie? <laughs> and if they don't know who he is, they're like, is that his real name? And right, I'm like, right. what do you think? You know? I mean, yeah. Of course not, you know. Oh, it's not his real name. No. <laughs> it's not his birth name, but yeah, he's John Doe to everybody else. Ah, uh, okay, all right. He's a punk right. rocker. Yeah, 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 yeah. I remember uh, in December 1970, uh, December 24th, 1970, DOA was playing in Tampa at the university there, and I was spending some time there, so that DOA brought bad memories to that. And um, so tell me about I find most people have never seen either version of the the other versions of the movie, which is also kind of interesting, too, because as I was like starting to make it, I was asking people I'm like, you ever see this movie? No. You know, that was coming up a lot. So I was like, OK, cool. It's a good story. Like, why not? Let's look at the trailer. Let's look at the trailer. Let's okay. look at the trailer. My name's Frank Bigelow, and I've got a story. Maybe it's a confession, too. I'll leave that up to the police. Whatever it is, it won't surprise me. My husband. I haven't seen you before. You don't know what you walked into, do you, Bigelow? Illuminate me. You've been poisoned. Are you saying this is gonna kill me? 
You're scared, aren't you? Don't fight, it'll go quicker. What are you going to do? Find out why. There was a man. You've been dealt a bad deal. So don't make it worse. So did they tell you how long? A couple days, a week at most, if I stay quiet. Yeah, but you haven't stayed quiet, have you? How does he know about me? What am I supposed to do now? The more you exert yourself, the faster the fire is going to burn. Great thing about this country, there's always more. When your time's up, your time's up. I'm not a corpse. Promise. <laughs> here it is. <laughs> you filmed it all here in San Agustin. Yeah. All, How, all, most of it, honestly, within blocks of where we're sitting right now. Really? Yeah, almost everything. So close, you, you can't even believe it. So what are the logistics behind that? So you, you show Bridge of Lions... Mm -hmm. Two cars. What happened to the rest of the traffic? Uh, we blocked the uh, bridge <laughs> of lions. Uh, we had we had police detail. No with us. wonder. <laughs> uh, we got two takes. We got two takes of uh, that. So that uh, that's one of them. There you go. And uh, the other. <laughs> yeah, we were only allowed to. Um, well, for anybody that doesn't live here, uh, to block the bridge of lions is. Uh, One way to become instantly hated, I would say, in this town. Yeah. <laughs> so what we did was, uh, yeah, we had police detail, and we just timed it out, and it was like we, we had the one car at the bottom and the other car at the, you know, and it was like, ready, and, like, we held everything. It was like, go, boom, and then they drove, and then, like, as soon as they got over, it was like, boom, and then they let traffic go through, and then we reset, and then we stopped again, and... <laughs> that was one of the trickier things on the movie. I imagine. Who pulls the, the strings to make that happen? Pulls the strings. <laughs> Ed Wood. Yeah, I don't know if you know the movie Ed Wood, but it's one of my favorite uh -oh. movies. And that's Bella Lugosi's line. And pulls the strings. Uh, <laughs> uh, you mean like how do we get yeah, like the, the logistics? How do we get the talking police to the involved? City, and, the, you know, to go ahead and block it. Yeah, get the police involved well, and all that. Well, um, I mean, you know, I'm pulling a lot of strings. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people are pulling strings. Well, um, initially, uh, when I moved here, so right after John said, yeah, that, that would be cool. And then I was I started to try to, I, I wrote a couple versions of the script that were terrible. And then, um, and I basically, um, I don't know if you know who Roger Corman is, mm -mm. but uh, he's a legendary like kind of B-movie producer who's given many directors their start over the years. And uh, he has all these kind of crazy rules about like how to make a low budget movie. But one of his big things is, is like if you have access to like a racetrack, then you should make a movie about race cars. You know what I mean? Like, Whatever, I, I heard a story once that he made a movie, somehow he got access to a tank, and so he made a war movie just because he had access to a tank. I, you know, so given that, like, you know, that I'm a low budget filmmaker, I mean, you know, basically I started to like put things together, like, oh, what do we have here? that's available. Oh, the lighthouse. Well, that will be amazing. Oh, the alligator farm. Well, that would be amazing. Price's Barbershop. Well, that's amazing. Like, you know, if nobody's ever been to Price's Barbershop. You have to go. Um, you know, uh, right. All these things. We used a bathroom in the ice plant. We used uh, the distillery right here. Uh, that's the warehouse that they uh, get shoved around in. Um, um yeah when he gets his 
Oh, I can't. I can't give away all the things. But no, no, but, no. but when I, when one person gets their head dunked in the toilet, that I saw was, that. That's in the men's room at the ice <laughs> plant. Um, yeah, that's a great shot. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, we filmed in the Leitner Museum and the Treasury Building. Anyway, all of these things. As I started to assemble, like, oh, we have this. We have this. Magic Beach Motel is amazing. You know, like all these things fit the period. Okay, and then after. I kind of assembled all of these things, and it was terrible. Um, that's when um, Nick Griffin came on. He's the writer of the movie. And uh, I got introduced to him through John Doe. And then he kind of took all these things that I had created, like barbershop, this, like steam room at the Lightner, you know, all these different things. And then he started to weave it together. And then once, like, he had it written out, it was like, well, how do we... Yeah, there were some things that, okay, the alligator farm, yeah, lighthouse, right, these things are there, they're built, they're ready to go. We don't have a hospital. What are we going to do? We need a hospital. We need a police station room. We need, you know, all of these, you know, we need a hotel room that is, you know, we need two hotel rooms, actually, you know. So a lot of things were, you know, then I would start to put things together, like, okay, I used a hallway in the treasury building. And, um, you know, it has like a wainscot that runs along the thing and the certain kind of doors. So I basically found that door. And then in the police station, when he's walking through the hallway into the police station, that's actually in the treasury building. But then when he gets into the police station, that's a set. But I built the set with my mom, the production designer, um, you know, and then we would try to match it so that it would look like the hallway matched the police station. So there was a lot of, I mean, a lot of effort of just connecting all these dots, which took a while. Um, I worked with this woman, Emma Keating, and uh, who lived here, and I met her, and uh, she came on board, and she became a producer, and Emma did just tons of legwork, and but we, after I got here, I found out that there was a film commission, and I met the head of the film commission, Marty Lewis, who has uh, left us, which is very sad. And uh, Marty was amazing. And Marty just started connecting dots and connecting me with people, people that lived here, uh, like our location manager, Rick Ambrose, like he lives here. Um, Stuart Bicknell, who, you know, is our gaffer, he lives here. And, you know, all of a sudden things just started connecting and... Chat light. Say what? <laughs> Chad light. Chad light. Yeah. Chad light. Yeah. Chad light actually came... I think Marty actually, yeah, Marty actually introduced me to Chad Light. Yep. <laughs> um, yeah, he came to one of the first readings even before. I had a reading at my house where I got like 15 people to come. This was on my second draft of the script uh, before Nick was involved. And uh, it's really lucky that Nick became on board because he's a great writer and I am not. So... Um, I needed that, but yeah, Chad came and, uh, I had all these people at my house and everybody was reading the scripts and we just like, we did like, um, not really a table read cause no one had read it, but I just wanted to hear what it sounded out like out loud. And it sounded pretty terrible to be honest. So <laughs> I was like, yeah, this needs work. So as, as a director, mm-hmm. You were in several hats. Yeah, it, especially it, as an indie film director. Right. So how do you surround yourself with people that share the same vision towards the end point that you want to produce? Um, well, I mean, I had a very small crew. Um, my cinematographer, Peter Berglund, I've worked with him many times. Um And we've just been like best of friends for years and years. Um, he lived in Los Angeles. He lives in England now. Um, so he lived a couple miles away from me. And uh, I first met him. I did a 
video for uh, the band Real Big Fish, and I had never met Pete before. And I this was when I lived in New York at this time, and um, so I ended up moving to L.A. And this was all before that, but I went to L.A. to shoot this video, and uh, and Pete was my cinematographer. It's too long of a story to get into, like how it all connected together, but. I walked on set and there he was. And um, within like minutes, I just knew like we were going to be friends for life and have been. Um, so, I mean, he is like my rock because, you know, it's like he's the one person that I really have to convey, you know, visually like what's happening here. Um, and then luckily, I, you know, I met people like I just met Stuart right away and Stuart I mean you know that I've, now I'm now I've got camera now I've got lights I'm good <laughs> you know we just need a sound guy and then like Stuart connected us with the sound guy Dustin who lives in Jacksonville and all of a sudden you know we just started piecing it together and um and there was a lot of like family things which is another very weird thing about the movie. So like Pete's son, Jack, who lives in LA, he came out and he was uh, our digital guy and uh, camera um, assistant. Um, John Doe's daughter, Elena, came out. Um, she did art department with my mom, who's the production designer. And I had worked with Elena actually before on... Uh, my last film, um, uh, Stuart's son, uh, Keaton is, uh, co-editor, <laughs> um, Emma's, uh, stepfather is Mr. <laughs> Phillips, you know, so there's a lot of like right. these weird, you know, just. It's a family affair. <laughs> it, it really was a family affair. And that was like, really, that was a great thing. So I saw on, on the credits, uh, Bonnie Drunken Miller. Yeah, that's my mom. That's your mom? Yeah, I was yeah. wondering if that was your mom. Yeah. Yep, Bonnie Drunken Miller. Yeah. And she played a big part in this whole thing. Yeah, well, that's a funny thing. So the first time I met Marty, and uh, it breaks my heart that Marty didn't live long enough to see the movie because he was so instrumental in, like, helping me connect all these dots. But my first meeting with him he didn't know who John Doe was and so <laughs> I was like hey you know like here I am this like guy that's like moved here from LA you know and I'm like hey I'm gonna make this movie uh you know it's gonna be independent movie and uh John Doe's the star and he's like who <laughs> you know and he's just looking at me like right. is that real is that is that the guy's real name you know and then I was like yeah and I'm like uh my mom it's going to be the production designer. And uh, I don't want to say how old my mom is because she will get really mad at sure. me. But, um, Never tell. Uh, yeah, whatever. You can you can uh, Google me, figure out my birthday is, and then, you know, figure out the appropriate amount of years to add on to it if you really want to know. But uh, he said, uh, he goes, oh, really? Has she worked on other movies and stuff? And I was like, No. <laughs> She's never worked on a movie ever. And he just looked at me like, hey, I, I could just tell immediately. I was like, oh, no, you know, Marty's not getting me. But he did. And he, like, helped just turn it all around. And he was really instrumental in helping pull a lot of strings, especially with, like, the city. I had to go to the city, get permits, connect with the police, you know, all those kind of things. Do you have to have like some type of insurance when you're doing oh, all of this? Oh yeah, yeah, big insurance policy. Um, well, I did make the movie um, through with you know with the Screen Actors Guild. Okay. So most of the uh, actors in the movie are part of the Screen Actors Guild. So yes, you have to have huge insurance for that, um, but also the camera. Uh, red, the, red. Yeah, we used a red. And uh, those are expensive cameras. It's an expensive camera. The lenses are very expensive. Yeah. So What's I, I'm not really much of a tech person on, on that. And that's where, like, Pete comes in 
And also the very dear friend of mine, David Fisher, who's like our post-production supervisor, but he's, uh, he's just, I've been working with him for like 30 years and, um, he's like the technical guy. Like I just, I, you know what I mean? I don't know that much about like all these kind of different cameras and like, you know, formats and, you know, it's, that's a little bit of that stuff is overwhelming to me. So at what point did you decide to uh, become a filmmaker? What, what, what was the trajectory that took you to that decision? Um, well, I studied radio and television in college, and then I quickly moved on to only wanting to do radio. And I did make a documentary in college, and I... I had kind of just done, I had to do some video production. This is like a long story. And then I ended up meeting that guy, David Fisher. And then this other guy, Mike Joshua, who I worked with Mike at the radio station. He ended up writing a screenplay. And one day he was, we were just talking about it. And he was like, oh, I wrote a screenplay. And then I was like, can I read it? And he was like, yeah. And then I read it. And I was just like, we should make this movie. And he's like, you but we don't know how to make movies. I was like, we'll figure it out. <laughs> YouTube it. Yeah, well, well, there was no YouTube at that point. <laughs> but, I mean, yeah, we just figured it out. At, at that moment in my life, I, I had worked in radio for many, many years, and I had switched careers, and I moved to New York City, and um, I was working at Arista Records for legendary record guy Clive Davis, and I... To be completely honest, I was um, I was not feeling that I was being creative at all. I had come out of this world where I was making uh, you know all kinds of production and um, creating events and booking bands and uh, you know managing people. I mean, I was running a radio station when I was 29 years old and. Uh, and it was very creative and it was cool and it was exciting. And there were, you know, celebrities and people coming to the radio station every day. And is that in New York? In New York? No, I was in Boston. Mm -hmm. And then I moved to New York to take this job and it was very corporate. And there was no real, I mean, there were, I shouldn't say there was no creativity because there was, but it wasn't like, I was so used to like a daily creative blast. I mean, I'm running a radio station, <laughs> you know, every day there's something, there's a comedian on the morning show, there's, you know, a musician, you know, I mean, it was nuts. It, you know, it was just every day there was something crazy going on. There was a new record. There was something, you know, there we were making a commercial. We're doing, you know, character voices. We're, creating bits were, you know, doing interviews with bands and like, you know, oh my gosh, I've got a, you know, I'm interviewing the Red Hot Chili Peppers in two days. You know, I'm, you know, oh, oh I got, I got to get my act together. You know, I'm interviewing Nirvana. Uh, I got to get that to going. I'm booking an event. The Smashing Pumpkins are playing. Uh, You know, I'm talking to the Smashing Pumpkins management. I'm doing, you know, all these things, super crazy creative. And then I get this weird job. It was a cool job, but I don't know. It was like at that moment, I was just like, I need to do something creative. And I, you know, I like to edit and I edited a lot of audio tape. And, you know, I just created a lot of things and I felt like some void. And then once I kind of did it, I was like, this is awesome. Because it kind of took everything from all the worlds I like, like music and sound effects. I mean, I know that sounds stupid, but I mean, I made commercials and stuff. So, like, I love sound effects. Right, right. So the, the DOA put it all together for you? Or were there other films before that that you worked on that kind of yeah, brought that creativity all, forward? Yeah, all the other movies. I mean, I made three feature films before this and I've made a couple little short documentaries I've done a lot of music videos I love doing music videos like MTV kind of thing yeah I had some videos played on MTV when yeah. they used to play videos yeah 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 I, I thought they were doing some awesome videos way back then and on MTV that I really liked they were just uh, 
well produced, and the music, of course, was awesome. Yeah, I love doing music videos because I would get to go hang out with a band, and I love music, so you know. You I, play an instrument? Yeah, I mean, I'm more of a bass player than anything, but yeah, I have a band. But we, we don't have to talk about that on this podcast. <laughs> you have a band. I do. But on a mission from God. <laughs> yes, we are. But, uh, yeah, it's just like all these different worlds. I was a theater minor, too. So I did, like, some improv comedy in college, you know. So, I you know, I don't know. It kind of all ties together. I'm trying to, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, you were sharing with me about, uh, and we don't have to talk about it if you don't want to, but I thought it was fascinating, the uh, rock and roll uh, dinner. Oh, my oh. rock and roll TV show. Uh, that was that was My really, failed rock and roll yeah, TV Yeah, but show. the concept was so cool. Tell me more about that. Well, that's just kind of all part of that creative brain of like always like thinking about stuff and... Um, yeah, I had this idea, and it was going to be <laughs> like I was going to go out to dinner with rock stars. And yeah, yeah. I, after all of that stuff with working in New York, and I worked at Tommy Boy Records, and and then all of a sudden I moved to L.A., and I was directing videos, but I suddenly find myself back in radio again. And for about two years, I produced this show called Jonesy's Jukebox, and it was hosted by this guy, Steve Jones, who is the guitar player of the Sex Pistols. And uh, I just loved it. And at the time, uh, he would take me out to dinner every Sunday night after the show. It was a two-hour show on Sunday night. And uh, I loved it. He got to pick all the music. Um and it was just very different from like the corporate kind of radio world. And it was awesome. But we would go out to dinner and he would start like telling me all kinds of stories, which I'm not going to tell. Um, but I really had this like inspiration that, oh, people, rock stars, they, they confess lots of things at dinner. They get very relaxed at dinner. And, and we would have other rock stars join us at dinner sometimes on Sunday night. And, you know, conversations would get very loose and cool and not, you know, like a... Censor. Yeah, not a typical interview. You know what I mean? Like something oh, yeah. would come out of, you know... And uh, so I had this idea I was going to do this TV show and I was going to be like a, I was going to take people out to dinner, rock stars out to dinner. And then, they, by the way, don't steal my, I don't, <laughs> like, somebody's going to steal my idea. Um, all right. All right. We don't have no, to. No, <laughs> no. I mean, so basically what I was going to do is go to dinner with a, like a rock star. They were going to... Um, orders whatever like we were going to go to a restaurant that served their favorite dish and they and they they would order it but then we'd go in the kitchen and then the chef would basically uh make that dish and then and then i would eat that food with the rock star and we would have <laughs> an interview so that was my idea and how, what, what and i made this thing called a sizzle reel and i i, I almost landed a deal and I don't know. Everybody liked it. And then I just, then it all just, it just failed horribly, which I, I mean, that, that's like a whole nother part of just, I don't know if you want to do things and you want to be like indie guy and do make, you know, you have to like be prepared to just get smacked in the face, right? right. you know, like it's still a great idea, but I couldn't get anybody to just, you know, land it. And yes, I could have done it on YouTube. A lot of people, why don't you just do it on YouTube? And I'm like, I don't have the money for it. Like, I don't know. Now I'm going in like another direction. I'm going to go make a movie. Like, you know what I mean? I have to take certain steps or like I won't. But I, I've had many failures and it was a failure. And then... um and then out of it, though, became like a, a very weird thing that ultimately I ended up because of the rejection and because I was told that um, I have no 
uh, culinary um, background, I enrolled at Le Cordon Bleu at, in Pasadena, and I went for three semesters, and I studied culinary arts, at which point <laughs> I killed a lobster by putting a knife in the back of his head, <sighs> and then I became a vegetarian on my 59th birthday, and um, now I'm a vegan, and I'm 59. See, now you can figure out how old my mom is. <laughs> but don't say it. Let them do it. Okay, so so where are you going next? What's what's next for you? I don't know. Are you the waiting to see what happens? What happens the, with the this film festival on Friday? Well, and I mean the film's going to be uh, playing um, in Saint Augustine at the Saint Augustine Film Festival, but I don't know the dates of that yet. I don't even know if I'm allowed to actually say that. So we can edit that out. Is <laughs> when's this going to air? <laughs> well. <laughs> I work with you on that. So okay, no, no problem, no problem. So, tell me more about the local situation in San Agustin with film. And uh, I know that Rick Ambrose, he's mm -hmm. always has uh, scouting for different yeah. uh, movies in town. And why why San Agustin becomes such a little mecca for all this? Little... I, I mean, it's I all. Re I don't re really know. I mean, I. I've had, very, first of all, very few people have actually seen the film. So, um, yeah, I mean, you're one of like a, a small amount of people. that. Well, have, thank you. I'm honored. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. Um, <laughs> I had somebody like watch it recently and they were just like, is this what St. Augustine looks like? Because <laughs> they had never been here. Right, right. But I don't know why. Because, I mean, first of all, people were great. Like, people were just unbelievably cool with me filming, you know? And so... I mean, Evergreen Cemetery, you know the Leitner Museum, the Treasury Building, you know, all these places. Um, and stuff looks so authentic, you know? I mean, like, that's the crazy thing. And when I moved here, and this is like right before John Doe came to play, you know, I'm just walking around. And I'm looking at the whole thing, and I'm... In, in my head, I'm like, this is crazy. It's like a little Hollywood back lot. And that's like the way we treated the whole thing. Right, it was right. just like, this is our little back lot. Right. Who, who did all the editing to make it look all like that? I mean, some obviously there were uh, signage that would reveal that we're not in the 1940s. Um, somebody local did all that? No, no uh, good friend of mine, Jimmy. Who lives in uh, Boston? Another good friend of yours. Yeah, he's a wizard. He's a wizard. Yeah, he. Uh, I also had another friend, Ethan, who worked on some stuff. He lives in New York. Who I, I've worked with both of those guys, and um, there was a bit of uh, digital erasing of certain things, like the Bridge of Lions shot. Mm -hmm. uh, they took out like the. Uh, signals and stuff and there was a sign you know it's kind of hard to explain if you're not looking at it but um yeah like the front of the lightner we used as the Ponce de Leon hotel so we had to erase some stuff you know like one of the characters walks into the entrance of the lightner and we had to erase the lightner museum you know right right little things like that do you use a drone we used a drone there was a shot in the lighthouse that I really liked, but it looked like it was from It was a where? drone, yeah. It was a drone. Mm -hmm. It's pretty cool. That's like one of the few things that I kind of, uh, modern conveniences that I, I mean, obviously, I didn't shoot it on film. I would have loved to. We Actually, that was our original idea was to shoot it on film, but uh, it's too hard, and especially here. If I was in L.A., I could probably pull it off because... There's a lab there, but 
suddenly I was like, I can't be shipping film to Los Angeles and back. It's not going to work. It's just not conducive to the whole thing. But um, we just used, you know, mostly use like one light in a lot of places, which is like a real common thing in film noir. You know, we tried to keep it stripped down. And like this is lit up more than like most of the sets are, you know. Um, but the drone, because what's cool about the drone is there's a couple, there's quite a few shots on drone in the trailer and the cemetery. He's walking through the cemetery. That's a drone. You know, I mean, if it was like Alfred Hitchcock, he wouldn't have had a drone, but he would have had a crane. But right. we didn't have the money for a crane. Right. A lot easier to just fly a drone up. And yeah, it it helps make it seem a lot bigger, but that's well that's one of the cheats where I'm like, yeah, I really because I did try to make the movie I wanted the movie to look like it was actually made in the forties, but somehow make it accessible to people in their twenties. Mm. You know, because if you watch a lot of old movies, you know, there's certain things where you're just like, yeah, you know, they've stepped it up, you know? So, yeah, the drone, I think, kind of helped with that. Kind of brought it up to today. Yeah, just gave it a little bit of like a modern edge without being, you know, too ridiculous. And we use some digital effects, gunshot blasts, and things like that. Those aren't real guns, so. Oh, <laughs> I imagine not. Um, so from here, where do I go? Yeah, I don't know. You mean like where do I go with the movie? Well, I mean after that. Um, I would imagine, uh, you know, probably going to be in some more film festivals and then we'll figure out uh, what the strategy is. I mean, I'm talking to distributors and, you know, can't really talk about it that much. But, sure, sure, sure. But they, the, the world of uh, indie filmmaking is changing constantly. And so I would say, you know, we filmed this before the pandemic and, um, you know, a lot of things have kind of changed because of the pandemic. So, um, so you know, people aren't going to the movie theaters as much anymore. And right. now, now things are turning into streaming and then, right. you know, and right. then that kind of, so I'm kind of piecing all of that together, but right. it will be at some point, it will be streaming. So a lot of musicians, Uh, who were not able to get record contracts with big labels, ended up producing their own stuff and mm -hmm. putting it out there. Is there a parallel with that with indie f films? Yeah, but I th I would say making an indie film is even crazier. Yeah, I would imagine so. But distribution-wise, do you have I mean, other channels that well, do not require... Way. I mean, the thing is, is that you... What I'm kind of finding and that's fascinating is like when you really just strip it down, people ask one question, how can I see the movie? They don't seem to care if it's in a movie theater. They don't care if it's on Netflix or Hulu or it doesn't. All they want to know is an answer to the question. How do I see your movie? So, Yeah, that's kind of the big thing, you know what I mean? But so, uh, yeah, it'll at some point it'll be released on multiple platforms. And then, you know, and that's how people will see it. Who influences you more? Of the directors that you've... <sighs> what, Walter Hill? Or, uh, it's a tough one because there's just so many. And I like... I like all kinds of movies. So, you know... It, it's like I'm not just like one thing. I mean, I do love Alfred Hitchcock. I mean, I, I, there's definitely an obsession. I took a film class when I was in high school, when I was a senior in high school, and uh, and we watched Psycho, and uh, and that's still one of my favorite films, like hands down. And that 
if you know the film well, there's mm-hmm. there's a shot in DOA that it is like right out of Psycho. Like, I mean, you can watch the movie and figure it out, but um, it's pretty obvious, and uh, and it's not a shower scene, um, <laughs> but. Yeah, that movie kind of blew me away because that was the first time where somebody was kind of, you know, my teacher, Mr. Lipschitz, I swear that was his name. Lipschitz? Yeah, Lipschitz. I'm not I'm not even making them <laughs> look it up. But, you know, he would talk about it was just like the shower sequence in Psycho, you know, he's mm-hmm. like the knife never penetrates her skin, you know, like, or things that, you know, he would just talk, you know, the angles or this, or like at the very end of the movie, like you can see uh, Norman's mother's face superimposed like over his face when, and you hear, you know, his mother's voice, you know, you wouldn't even hurt a fly, you know, all of that. And, right. Um, so, yeah, that kind of blew me away. But, you know, I mean, I love Martin Scorsese and um, Stanley Kubrick. And I don't, but, you know, I don't know. It's endless. It's it's really sure. endless. Sure. You have a, a, an aspiring uh, filmmaker. What advice would you tell someone who wants to say, I want to do what you did? How would you? And they wanted you to mentor them. How would you go about doing that? What would you say? What would you do? Um, well. Mistakes to avoid and that kind of thing. Well, the first thing I would say is that uh, much like music, if I was going to say something to a musician, uh, I would say, you know, it's going to come down to the songs or it's going to come down to the script. Like, if you don't have a good song, you're probably not going to, you know what I mean? You're probably not going to really have the career that you want to, like, potentially have. But if you have a hit song, you can be playing Fairgrounds for the next 20 years. You know what I mean? Like, let's just put it this way. Vanilla Ice is coming to town, okay? And I'm not joking about that. Really? Yeah, like next year. Vanilla Ice, okay? So... Um, and I think with the, if you're going to make a movie, you got to have a good script because if you don't have a good script to start, then it kind of doesn't matter what you do. But you thought you had a good script and then somebody else came and rewrote it. Yeah. I kind of knew I didn't have a good script, Mm. which is that that's important too, is that. Well, first of all, <laughs> I would never advise anybody to make an independent film unless, like, you're really in it for the long haul. I mean, I started working on this over five years ago. So now some things, it took two years to get John Doe from the moment where I said, hey, I want to make this movie, to him saying, yes, I can come to St. Augustine for a month because he's a touring musician, so that wasn't an easy thing to do. And then, you know, there's scheduling, and then you got to fill the other roles. And, you know, so I would say, you know, you need to have a good script. And, um, you know, you got to figure out a way to make, you got to figure out a way to get the money up. So how are you going to do that? And... You got to be able to uh, try to get the most famous people you can in your script, in your movie, because that's going to help you. You're going to need somebody. You need somebody. And uh, I don't know. Is there uh, an aware? <laughs> do, do you think that, generally speaking, uh, there is. Uh, a tendency to start maybe liking black and white movies again, or I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be good. <laughs> black and white's awesome. I think so. I think it's uh, it requires a lot more talent than color, basically because you only have black and white to deal with. Mm-hmm. 
And so you're working with shades of gray and lighting, and, and so color makes up a lot of the... It also saved us in a lot of ways, too, because... So, <laughs> you know, we're on a micro budget, and we need cars from the 1940s, mm. which... Um, Luckily, we met Sydney. Sydney, yeah, okay. Yeah, we yeah. met Sydney. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Sydney owns the uh, Classic Car Museum here in St. Augustine. Right. A great place to go. Yeah. And uh, he turned us on to all these cars. And, you know. I was wondering about that. That's where they came from. Oh, yes. Cool. S- except for Bigelow's car. Uh, I actually bought that car off of uh, Facebook. That's a whole nother story. Uh, Emma found that car on uh, Facebook, and um, I bought it in Jacksonville, and um, I bought it for $5,000. And I went up to Jacksonville. I took an Uber to Jacksonville, and I got in that car, and I drove it two miles, and smoke started pouring out of it, and it (laughs) broke down (laughs) It took me about a year and a half to get that car up to speed to be in the movie. But in the end, it was worthwhile because that car is in the movie all the time. But yeah, yeah. all the other cars. But anyway, the reason I was going to say this is because so a lot of people have these, you know, 1940s cars, but they'll be painted in like lime green. There were no lime green cars. You know what I mean? Right, but right. In black and white, it's gray. Right, 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 right. So right. there's a right. lot of, in some ways, we benefited. That really helped us keep it, period. Um, I mean, because we would have been, there. I don't think we would have been able to pull it off in color. Originally, I did want to shoot it in color, um, like Chinatown. That was kind of my first vision. I was going to be like Chinatown, but. Then I was like, no, well, film noir is supposed to be black and white. Right, right. What defines film noir, in your opinion? What do, I mean, I know it's, it's a time period, but is it just because it's black and white or because of a certain time frame? Um, it's usually, uh, you know, the lead character's doomed. You know, that's kind of the thing. They're doomed and they're not going to make it. <laughs> he dies at the end <laughs> pretty much you know and there's usually a detective involved uh, yeah there's usually a detective involved and they, and there's usually a femme fatale you know that like you know you're gonna do anything for this woman uh, like you know fatal attraction <laughs> yeah that's usually the running thing yeah so. that's the drill <laughs> hey man thank you thank you I appreciate you coming in uh Good luck in uh, Fort Lauderdale. Thank you. And w- from there, any place else where it might be? St. Augustine will be the next one after that. And I, d- I don't, it's January 12th through the 15th is the festival, but I don't know like when or where we're screening. Mm-hmm. I-, I think in the past, the Corazon had something Yeah, going but that's there. closed. Oh, okay. See, I'm, Sadly. I'm up to date. <laughs> yeah, you haven't driven by there, huh? <laughs> no, not like <laughs> Well, thank you again, man. You're Good welcome. luck, and I really appreciate you coming in. And thank you for having me. Oh, it's been a pleasure, and also letting us see the the your your work is awesome, and I really liked it. My wife liked it. We, we all sat at home and watched it. It was that's great. Yeah, it was were great. You like, were you like, I know where that is. I yeah. know where that is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was good. I saw the, the lighthouse and the spiral thing. lighthouse. That, that was a great shot too. I like, but I really like that toilet scene. <laughs> the toilet scene. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I there. Yeah, that's a good trick. I'll, I'm going to tell you when after how I did it. Okay, and then also tell me how you know. I often wonder how they do shots with mirrors, where you don't see the camera. And I've seen some tutorials online. But there was a shot in 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 your fl- movie where there's a mirror in the background. I think it was in a bar. Uh huh. There's a mirror in the oh, background oh. of the bar. There's actually a mirror in the background of the hotel room when he walks in with the bellhop. Uh huh. And he walks past a mirror. Yeah. You just have to angle it right. You know what I mean, so that you're not in the way. I see. I see. So it's not like filming, pretending to be a mirror, and then reversing the camera the other way. It's not like that. Yeah. Like so. In the bar scene that you're talking about, um, 
yeah, there is a mirror behind him. So the camera is just off to an angle a little bit so that you don't see the camera and the reflection of the mirror. It's like the character is blocking it. Right, 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 right. So you're seeing like the back of him. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's the trick right yeah, there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. You're Good welcome. luck to you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, brother. My pleasure. Cheers. Cheers.